first of all, I want to thank you for your very warm welcome. Uh, you may remember some of you, some of your faces are familiar, having visited you in August, uh, but now I'm here to a far greater responsibility of preaching the Word of God to you. And uh, that is a privilege. Now I'm retired, I still preach occasionally in Castlefields Church on a fairly regular basis there, but uh, this is the first time I've come here to preach. And I count it a great privilege to be invited. And I was so encouraged to hear the children learning the catechism. My wife and I are revising our learning of the catechism. <laughs> and I tell you, when you get older, it's a struggle oh, yeah. to remember those phrases. So when you are young and your minds are more elastic, yes. learn yeah. and imbibe those truths. Learn the whole thing. Uh, we, our, our pastor back at Coleman, my son Jeremy, is a stickler. He wants it word perfect. So uh, try and learn it word perfect. It's hard. But you will not regret it. I can assure you. Amen. So as we come to the Word of God, let me turn you to Genesis and chapter 48. There's a slight misprint on the uh, sheet you had. It's Genesis 48. I'm going to read the chapter, 22 verses. It's not as long as the first section that we had in Romans 8. It's more of a narrative, and we'll be concerned with verses 15 and 16 of this chapter. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. Now his father, of course, was Jacob. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt, before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you be, beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, These are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel, that's another name for Jacob, the name God gave him. The eyes of Israel were dim of age, so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. 
Now, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took it off his father's hands, removed it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. His father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he said Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you, and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Throughout the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, there are some wonderful examples of God's grace breaking into the lives of people. You think one of the outstanding cases would have been Manasseh. Manasseh, 55 year reign of terror. One of the last kings of Judah. He was a, a man of blood, oppressing the people. He was brought low in Babylon. God subdued him and drew him to himself, forgiving him and restoring him. Grace triumphed in the life of of Manasseh. Of course, in the New Testament, you have that persecutor, that violent man, that blasphemer, Saul of Tarsus, who met Christ, or perhaps we should say Christ met him on that Damascus road, and confronted him, and appointed him to be an apostle to the Gentile nations. You would not have liked to have met the Apostle Paul, when he was known as Saul of Tarsus. Your life would have been threatened, and yet he became one of the greatest Christians, a triumph of the grace of God. Jacob, or as he was named then by God, Israel, Jacob is sometimes overlooked, but the same grace of God triumphed in Jacob's life. He was the father of the twelve tribes, but he had a very checkered history. It takes up a large part of the book of Genesis. Most of the second half is taken up with different aspects of Jacob's life. Here in chapter 48, you have an old man. He's actually 147 years old. At this particular point, now some of these men lived a long time uh, in those days. But here is an old man. And here in verses 15 and 16 are the words that he spoke as he blessed Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So they are the words of a dying man, of an old man. He's in Egypt. He's weak in body. He can't see very well. But he's strong in faith and he is testifying, in particular in verse 15 here, of the grace of God that has changed his life. And I want us to see what he testifies as he prays to God to bless his grandsons. And you should be able to identify with this man. If you are a Christian, you should be able to identify with this man. I don't want you to understand what's happened this morning. Think, here's an old man talking about an even older man, and he's only talking to old men. That is not what I'm trying to do at all this morning. This is part of the Word of God, and it is for all of us, from the very youngest to the oldest. You can identify here with God's goodness, with God's grace that was displayed to this man, Jacob. Now, I'm not going to assume that we are all totally familiar with the life of Jacob. So I'm going to attempt, first of all, to give you a thumbnail sketch of his life, to draw out some of the highlights. 
put his testimony here in verse 15 where he says, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Here is a testimony to God and of God's grace. And it's the end of his life. So let me try and give you a thumbnail sketch. Now thankfully we have a thumbnail sketch already in the scriptures for us. It's in one of the minor prophets in Hosea chapter 12. Let me just read, if you don't want to turn to that, it may take you a while to find it, but uh, if you want to, it's in Hosea chapter 12 and verses 3 and verse 12. In verse 3, this is about Jacob. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. Yet he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him and found him in Bethel. And then in verse 12, Jacob fled to the country of Syria. Israel served for a spouse and for a wife he tended sheep. One of the commentators of Genesis draws attention to sort of bring these two strands of Hosea uh, chapter 12 together. He says he draws attention, first of all, to Jacob's successive concerns. First of all, he's concerned about his brother. He wants to get the blessing. And then he has trouble with Esau, as some of you will know. He's concerned with his brother Esau. Then he's concerned about a wife, a spouse, because he ended up with more than one wife, which clearly created its own problems. But uh, he ended up with a wife. So from concern about his brother, then there's concern about his, his, his wife and his family, then his concern is with God. And as you trace the life of Jacob, you will see those concerns. His brother, his wife and family, but with God. And increasingly with God. And you see these, these, these words here in Hosea chapter 11. He took his brother by the, by the heel. He fled to Syria. And that was because of Esau. These were concerns about his brother. Then he served for a spouse. He tended sheep. And remember how Laban deceived him. Twenty years he toiled as a shepherd for a wife. And then there were two wives. And then he prevailed. He wept. He sought favour from God. And he found the Lord God in Bethel. See those same concerns. His brother, then his wife and family, and with God, and an increasing concern with God. Now we can identify with, that, with this man Jacob. Like many of us, we've seen a good deal in our lives of darkness, perversity, iniquity, crookedness of sin, some of you, I don't know you well, but some of you may have a very messy background. A very messy and tangled web. And you've perhaps been on the receiving end of selfishness, of wrongs, of hatred. Sin works in human beings in a, so many different ways. It ruins lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of you may have had parents who were not kind to you, but abused you verbally, physically. That's very common, even in our world. Your family may not be a very happy family in terms of your background. You may have a brother or sister you don't talk to. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Some of these things are closely related to Jacob. Yeah. And you can identify them with him. And God does not cast you off at him only casts Jacob off because of these things and because of his sin and those who sinned against him. 
Grace shines very brightly in a world where sin threatens to destroy us. Jacob, the name Jacob, his very name indicates the kind of man he was. He grasped his brother by the heel. He was what is called a supplanter. He was deceitful. And he sought to obtain the blessing that belonged to Esau as the firstborn. And he indulged in deceit. And he capitalized on Esau's weaknesses and frailties. And he secured the blessing for himself. He was a schemer. He had a strategy. And with the collusion even of his mother, Rebecca, he stole Esau's <coughs> birthright and secured the blessing that was reserved for the firstborn son. <coughs> you know, he even indulged in lies. He even claimed that God had blessed him. He lied to Isaac. He lied about God. He said, well, God's, God's blessed me. God's enabled me to, to, to hunt successfully. And I've been able to cook this meal for you. Rebecca knew what was going on. She was behind the whole thing. So you see there was division in the family between husband and wife. And division between Esau and Jacob. Can you imagine the mess? Can you imagine the relationships that they had? It's no wonder then that Jacob, once he has done that, has to run for his life. He's afraid of Esau. Esau's his older brother. Esau's the, the red and hairy man. He's the strong man. He's the hunter. And Jacob's scared stiff. So again, with Rebecca's help, he flees. He flees from what he fears will be Esau's revenge. His past now has been filled with dire deceit. Selfish grasping, ambition, lies, even using God's name. He's driven away, and for 20 years he's with his uncle Laban. And Laban is one of the meanest men in Scripture. <laughs> he really is. You wouldn't have wanted to work for him. Kept changing his wages. But you see, what was God doing? Well, Jacob, you've been a deceiver. Now I'm going to give you a taste of what it's like to be deceived. God, God is dealing with him. He may not be aware of it, but God is dealing with him. And then he comes away from Laban with two wives. And on his way back, who should meet him? God. God met him in Bethel in chapter 28. Bethel means the house of God. He made a vow. You can see this man's beginning to learn. He made a vow, if the Lord be with me and keep me in this way, and I have bread and clothing and return in peace, then the Lord will be my God. You can read that in chapter 28 and verse 20. Then again, at Peniel, as he leaves Laban, preparing to meet Esau, he's in fear and trembling. Meeting Esau after all this time. Will he still hate me? Will he still be full of revenge? Will he still want my life? Will he still threaten me? And I'm not just on my own now. I've got wives, I've got children, I've got, I've got flocks. How is he going to treat me? And there in Paniel, chapter 32, he struggles with God. And such was the struggle that he came away with a permanent limp. He limped for the rest of his life. But he prevailed with God and God renamed him in Israel. Prince with God. No longer the deceiver. No longer the supplanter. No wonder when we stole the birthright yeah. and stole the blessing. Yeah. Now you are a prince with God. Yeah. But you see, who took the initiative? It wasn't, it wasn't Jacob, was it? It was God. Yeah. God met him in battle. Yeah. God met him in Peniel. Yeah. And God dealt with him. Yeah. And God humbled him. And the amazing thing, given 
the kind of man that Jacob was and what he had done in the past, the words that God spoke to him were not words of divine judgment. If God had turned around and said, Jacob, you've burned all your bridges. You've had it. Depart from me. Go away from me. I will have nothing more to do with you. If God had said he would have nothing more to do with Jacob, it would be nothing more than he deserved. God did not. God met with him. God met with him. And it led to him beginning to wonder the ways of God's dealings with him. He hears the voice of a gracious God. He hears the promises of God. And he learns repentance. He begins to learn humility. He begins to learn to trust in God. Grace teaches sinful, selfish deceivers. Amen. And most of us are all better. Yeah. We're all in the same boat. Yeah. We're all in the same category. Yeah. If our sins are not precisely the sins of Jacob, there are other sins. But grace teaches us, humbles us despite our sinfulness. And here is this dying man, 147 years old, who is now testifying, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. This is Jacob's dying testimony to the God of grace who has got him, as it were, by the scruff of the neck, shaken him, humbled him, and yet revealed his love and grace and forgiveness to him, Amen. and made him a prince. A deceiver becomes a prince, yeah. a prince with God. Amen. I've already begun to introduce you then to the second thing that we have here, coming specifically to the text. I want you to see where and what the grace of God makes a person say about God. Yes. We've seen, we've traced him. He was concerned, first of all, with his brother. Then he was concerned with the wife and spouse and family. Now he's concerned with God. And here he is at the end of his life. What does he have to say about God? What does grace what difference does it make? How does it change us? Yeah. It makes us talk about God in a way that we would never have done so before. Because we've tasted and experienced the grace of God in our hearts and lives. See, grace, as it were, takes you by the hand and it opens your mouth then to speak the praise of the God of grace. To tell what God has done for you. To say what God is to you. Because grace changes your heart. Changes your mind. It changes your will. It changes your desires. It changes your motives. And therefore it must come out in words and actions. And that's what we see here. As he blesses Ephraim and Manasseh. He has something to testify now about God. To Joseph and to his Jacob's grandsons. No longer now the deceiver, the grasper. No longer that fearful man who's on the run for his life. Now his testimony is about God. There's a threefold calling upon God here. I want to mention two of them briefly and focus then on the third. You see, first of all, he calls on the God of Abraham and Isaac. We think of the God who is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The God of the covenant. The God of promises. Now, I don't think Jacob had a great deal of time for Abraham. In the way that he dealt with his, his son Isaac. He didn't think very much of the promises of God. 
But now he's come to see that this is the God of covenant promise and covenant faithfulness. This is the God who's revealed his promises to Abraham and to Isaac. And now he's revealed his promises to him. The same promises, basically, about their descendants and the land of Canaan. He's promised them more than anything else to be their God. Amen. The God of Abraham, yes. Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's faith is now firmly fixed upon this God. And then, thirdly, well, the second thing is we'll, we'll come to in a moment. The third thing he mentions in his invocation is there in verse, uh, verse 16, the angel, the angel of the Lord who has redeemed me from all evil. This is God himself who appeared to Jacob. Yes. Many will tell you, and I have persuaded also, that this is God himself in human form. This is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. He made himself known to Jacob. Yeah. And he's redeemed me, he said. He has delivered me. He has rescued me. What has he been rescued from? Esau? Well, yes. But above all, he's been redeemed and delivered from his sin. From his sin. He's referring here to the specific event of Peniel. There's more than a sermon in that chapter. Because there, Peniel is the key turning point. But I wanted to focus on verse 15 and the second invocation, which refers amazingly to the whole of his life. Since I had my being, he's going back to the days when he was first born and began to live in this world, when he says, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day. The whole of my being. Since I had my being, mm. this God has fed me. And he's talking now, he's looking back, and he can see the way that God was had dealt with him when he was the deceiver, when he was the supplanter, when he was on the run from his brother Esau, when he was serving the labor, the meanest man on the earth at the time. He says, this God has fed me all my life long. What a wonderful testimony from a weak, dying, 147-year-old man. He's reflecting now on 147 years. And he said, all my life, God has fed me. Amen. God has cared for me. That word is fed is a very interesting one because it's a word from which you get shepherd. Feeding was part of feeding the sheep was part of the shepherd's responsibility. But Jacob is in fact saying, God has shepherded me. He's acted like a shepherd towards me. He's cared for me, he's protected me, he's guarded me. When I've been down, he's picked me up. When I've been wounded, he's healed me. He's restored me. Think of some of those phrases in Psalm 23. Jacob could have sung that song. David was a shepherd. He knew what it was to care for the flock. And Jacob was saying, but this God has cared for me like a shepherd all the days of my life. What a testimony. Who would have imagined that? A hundred, perhaps 30 years before. If you had seen him and known him, the kind of man that he was. But here it is. He's saying God has literally, God has shepherded me. Jacob knew what it was to be a shepherd. He spent 20 years of labor. Yeah. Sleepless nights, going after the lost, binding up the wounded, the sick. You know, a shepherd in those days was like a vet. You'd have to look after the sheep if they got ill. Sheep have a habit of wandering off, don't they? Yeah. They go their own way. Yeah. <laughs> Jacob 
scripture says, but God's been a shepherd to me. <coughs> this is what grace does. It brings you to see the goodness and the kindness, the care, the provision that God has made for you. And in fact, God was taking care of you long before you were ever converted. You didn't know it, you didn't recognize it, you fought against it. But no, that's what Jacob is saying here. All the days of my life, right. since I had birth, yeah. God's been taking care of me. Yeah. He's been patient with me, despite my stupidity and my sin and my deception and my fears and my anxieties. It's the God of grace who's brought him to this confession. You've been my shepherd my whole life. He's confessing with his lips. As in fact, he's praising God because he's teaching Joseph and he's teaching Ephraim and Manasseh. This is his testimony. He's linking them up with Abraham, with Isaac. He's giving them his blessing as Jacob. He's declaring God to them that they might know this God. The God that I know, he says. The God of grace. And you see, it is a repeated and a growing, developing testimony. I just want to read three or four passages from his life. And you'll be able to trace out how he is becoming more and more God conscious. By that I mean he's becoming more and more aware of God yeah. and the way that God is dealing with him and the way that grace deals with him. In Genesis chapter 28 and verses 13 and 15, we read these words. Genesis 28 verse 13. This is Jacob's part where Jacob makes his vow at Bethel. And behold, verse 13, Behold, the Lord stood above him and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and the south. And in you and your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. Same promise was given to Abraham. Genesis 12 and verse 3. And then notice verse 15. This is God speaking. But Jacob imbibes what God says. Believes what God says. Behold, says God, I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Jacob latched on to that promise. Yeah. He believed what God said. Mm. This was God dealing with him in grace, confirming to him that despite his sin, he had not left him. And God is saying, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you, Jacob. And then in chapter 31, and verse 5. Now here he's on the, on the run from Laban. He's fearful what Laban might do to him. But he says in verse 5 to Rachel, he said, I see your father, Laban, his face, his countenance, that is not favorable toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. So he's up against it. He's afraid. But he's not going to let that fear dominate him because God has said, yeah. I'll be with you. Yes. I will be with you. And he has been with me and will be with me. You get that again in verse 42 of the same chapter. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac have been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. He's speaking now to Laban. He's saying, Laban, all your efforts will come to no effect because God has blessed me. God is taking care of me. 
chapter 32, and verses 9 to 12. When Esau comes to meet Jacob, verse 9, Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which you've shown me. This man's been humble, isn't he? Yeah. He's been humble, he's confessing. I, I'm, not, I'm not worthy of these things at all. Not at all. I've crossed over this Jordan with my staff, now I've become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you say, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. See, there's not only humility, there's faith. Yeah. There's a confidence in God. He's trusting God's providence. The order of events, even now, he's facing Esau. And then in chapter 32, again in verse 30, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Now I said that Peniel is the crucial place. I have time to dwell on that. But look what he says. I have seen God face to face, and my life has been preserved. I've seen God face to face. I'm alive. I'm still alive. <coughs> That's his testimony. And then finally in chapter 35 and verse 3, Jacob returns to Bethel. He said, Let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. Is it any wonder that in chapter 48 as he is about to bless Jacob, uh, Joseph's sons, he says, this is the God who has fed me, shepherded me all my life long to this day. What's the explanation? There's only one explanation. Grace. Amen. The grace of God. He's overwhelmed him. He is now so conscious of God's goodness and kindness to him. He's overwhelmed by it. And now that grace fills his mouth with a testimony to God of his goodness and his grace. And effectively of his forgiveness, of his faithfulness. God has not abandoned this wretched sinner, this deceiver, this man who concocted all these plans to secure the blessings for himself. The grasper, but now he's received grace that has been given to him. And grace filled his heart through the testimony of God's love and goodness, his faithfulness and guidance, and his protection. The grace of God conquers sin. Amen. The grace of God protects you. The grace of God guides you. The grace of God enables you to hold fast in times of disappointment, in times of danger, in fears, in a world that is full of sin, full of horrible things. Grace triumphs. In the life of this man. But is that grace, is that same grace of God triumphing in your life? Can you say this with Jacob? You don't have to live 147 years to be able to say this. This God is the one who shepherded me, who yeah. fed me all my life and God. That is a wonderful testimony to be able to give. But only the grace of God can teach you to say that. And so that brings me to the third point. How can we make Jacob's testimony our own personal testimony? How can that be? 
What are we going to do? Jacob, we might say, finished well. He didn't start very well, but he finished very well because he was trusting in God. He lived a turbulent life. <clears throat> Even after Bethel and Peniel, there were hard times. Remember the diner incident? Mm. When the brothers killed the Shechemites yeah. because they had abused Dinah? And then there was the supposed death of Joseph. His brothers had sold him to Egypt. And then there were hard times because of the famine. He had to leave Canaan and go down to Egypt. The latter years of his life were not lived in Canaan, the promised land. They were lived in Egypt. That didn't alter his conviction. This was God's way. This was God's dealing with him. This is not a story of all's well that ends well. It's not some fairy story. Yeah. This is the revelation of God. Yeah. This is the revelation of the grace of God to one man in particular. But that same grace that is made known to us in Jesus Christ to all who believe and trust in him. So how can you make Jacob's testimony your testimony? Well, not until you have tasted the grace of God. Ryan said this morning, you're not born a Christian. Mm -hmm. Jacob wasn't born, if I can use the term out of, out of place, but Jacob wasn't born a Christian. Mm -hmm. He wasn't born a believer in the promises given to Abraham and Isaac. He wasn't born as well, the grace of God already inside of him. It's just going to then spring out. Now, this man was a sinful man. So you cannot have this testimony until you have tasted the grace of God. God made you. God made you the creature that you are in the image of God. He didn't make you a sinner. Yes, you were born a sinner. And you became even worse. You became more of a sinner. We inherited Adam's corrupt nature. And then we added to it our own actual sins and transgressions. Right. And some of us have wallowed very deep in the mire. And some of us have been sinned against. And we've got perhaps bitterness in our heart because of those who did not treat us well. At the end of the day, we only deserve the wrath of God. We deserve hell. We deserve judgment. I said before that Jacob could have sung Psalm 23. Yes. You remember how that psalm ends? Surely yes. goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now David wrote that as a younger man. That wasn't his testament at the end, but he was looking forward. He's saying essentially the same thing right. about the goodness of God and the presence of God. He said, well, I can't at this point say what Jacob is saying. How can you? Where do you do? What do you do? Where do you go? Where do you start? How can I taste the grace of God? You're going to wait for a Peniel experience or a, a Bethel experience? There's something better than that because those were one off. They were not repeated. Yeah. But we have in the scriptures a declaration of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's the whole purpose of the scriptures. Yeah. To point us to the good shepherd. Yeah. The ultimate good shepherd. Yeah. The one who lays down his life for his sheep. Yeah. What did he come to do? He comes into this world. Takes flesh and blood. He comes to seek and to save yeah. that which is lost. And you were lost, and so was I. Yeah. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, and so was I. You were a slave of sin and of Satan, 
And so was I. You were like a sheep that had wandered far away from the fold of God. You have gone your own way. You've done your own thing. If God left you to do that, it would be just. That's right. He didn't. You have a golden opportunity every time the scriptures are opened up and the gospel is preached to you and Christ is set before you as a good shepherd. Christ crucified. Christ who shed his blood on the cross to atone for our sin. Christ who paid the penalty for sin. Jacob was ultimately trusting in him, though he did not have as clear a picture as we have of him now from the New Testament scriptures. But every time the gospel is preached and Christ crucified is placarded before you, there is Christ reaching out with his arms, as it were, with his hands, and saying, come to me that you may have life. Amen. Turn from your sins, and I will forgive you because I've shed my blood on the cross. I'm atoned for sin. Christ came to die in the place of sinners like you and like me. Young and old, it doesn't matter. You don't have to wait until you're 147. You won't live that long, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> the best time to come to Christ is when you're young. Yes. Before you are hardened in your sin, those children standing out here. Let me speak to you particularly. Yeah. Do some of you think, well, I, I'm, I'm not old enough yet. I'm, I'm too young to come to Christ. I knew someone, he's still alive. He was in the church, he's in the church now in May, where I used to be a pastor. He can never remember a time when he did not believe in God. Mm. He believes he was converted when he was three. Yeah. Most of you sitting here this morning, children, are older than that, aren't you? Mm. Christ can save you. You say, well, what am I going to do? Well, you have to come to Christ. You have to trust in Christ. You have to cast yourself upon the mercy of God in Christ. But you come to Jesus, you come to the good shepherd. Amen. And Jesus says something very wonderful in John chapter 6. All the Father gives me will come to me. Amen. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly never cast out. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Do you believe that promise? Amen. Do you believe that if you come to Jesus Christ, you come to him and cast yourself upon him. He will save you. Maybe there's someone older here. Again, I don't know you. I've got reason to think many of you are Christians. Some of you may not be. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I'm not taking that risk. Mm -hmm. I want you to know. You say, well, I'm too old to come to Christ. I've turned the offers of salvation down repeatedly, again and again and again. I've hardened my heart. The door shut in my face. No, Christ stands before you as the good shepherd and says, come to me yes. and I will give you everlasting life. Wow. Don't make any excuses. You're not too young, you're not too old, you've not sinned too much. Look at Jacob. What kind of man was he? Did God spurn him and reject him? Oh, God came to him and visited him in love and <coughs> grace and saved him. What a wonderful Savior we have. You see, he's willing to save. Jesus Christ is able to save. Yeah. That's why he died on the cross. You don't have to do anything except trust him yeah. and turn from your sin. That's what it means to come to Jesus Christ. You come to him and you're saved. It's as simple as that. Why make it more complicated? With excuses. That's right. yeah. We all do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of coming, we draw back. But if you come to Christ, you'll find yourself in grace. 
by loving arms, nail-pierced hands, blood that was shed for sinners. Why will you not come? That's where you must begin. That's where you must begin. So don't say you're too sinful. Don't say you're too old. Don't say you've refused Christ too many times and he won't hear you. You have a warrant to come because Jesus Christ offers salvation to you. If you will not come, he will not turn you away. He will not slam the door in your face. He's a willing, gracious, powerful Savior who loves to save sinners. He loves to, that's why he came. That's why he came. What if you are a Christian? Maybe you have been a Christian very long. You say, well, I'm not sure I could say all these things that Jacob said. But I'm sure you want to say those things. If the grace of God is truly worthy in your heart, these are the things you want to be able to say, aren't they? You want to be able to look back, even in the short days of your life, let alone if you live to be over a hundred, to be able to say, this is the God who's been my shepherd all the days of my life. How can you then cultivate that God <coughs> consciousness, that sense of the presence of God, that this God has been with you? To becoming a Christian is only the beginning. And the grace of God begins to spread out in the sense that we understand more and more of this grace. You see, there is a developing understanding in Jacob. He's growing in faith. We traced out some of those verses. He's growing in humility. He's growing in thankfulness. He's growing in an acute awareness of the way in which the providence of God has guarded him and guided him and protected him. And it's those things which enable you then to grasp the hold of God and say, this is God's doing. And to identify those things and to believe those things and to be thankful for those things and to be humbled by those things. This is the way you will cultivate a God consciousness. This is the way you will cultivate that consciousness of God that will enable you to say increasingly, this God is my God. And he's been my shepherd all the days of my life. You can look back and you can trace, as it were, the hand of God in your life. How many sins has God in Christ forgiven you? How many times have you turned away? How many times have you shrunk back, backslid? But you're here because God has restored you. He cares for you. My daughter, that one where she brought you back. John Calvin once said of Jacob, by the rare and wonderful power of God, he had been an extraordinary man, delivered from many, many dangers. An extraordinary man. Supernatural. That's grace. Grace is supernatural. It's the power of God. It's the grace of God. You go through trials, you go through temptations. There are things that bring you anxiety. There are things you're afraid of. That's where you prove the power and the grace of God. Yeah. Through those things. That's where, when you come out the other end, that's where you have been tried and tested. I mean, you put it in the furnace and tried and tested. You say, but God has been with me. He's cared for me. He's brought me through this. Yes. And you see, as you say that repeatedly, and that experience is repeated in various ways, you have a growing conviction. This God, this God, is the God who shepherded me all the days of my life. So the older you become as a Christian, the stronger your faith ought to be. And the conviction ought to be because you prove God's faithfulness, you prove God's goodness, you prove God's promises, 
and he proved his grace. At the end of the day, God has got a stronger hold on you than you have on him. Amen. That's what grace does. Grace won't let you go. Grace won't abandon you. If that were the case, God is denying himself. That's right. And he never does that. His glory is at stake. Wonderful. Therefore, he puts testimonies like this upon the lips of those to whom he is gracious. But may God help us fill our hearts with that confidence in God. May we come there with a renewed love this morning and a resolve to walk humbly with the Lord our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, how gracious a God you are. Far beyond our comprehension, we cannot plumb the depths of your love, its length, its breadth, its height, its depth. It is immeasurable. Because you are the God who is infinite and eternal and unchangeable, yet the God who has reached out to us in love and grace and sent Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, to save us from our sins, to show us something of your love. Lord, build up then our faith, increase our thankfulness, and humble us into more and more simple, childlike trust and confidence and dependence upon you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.